This is the Evening News of Tuesday, February 4, 2014. I'm Michael Young. Thanks for joining us. Making the headlines tonight. Amerindian women record the highest rate of cervical cancer. Man requests to go to jail to stay away from his wife. Rohi says opposition has links to criminals and the underground economy. Four persons shortlisted for the CEO post at the Ghana Elections Commission. Home Affairs Ministry to beef up response to noise nuisance reports. And GRA records increased revenue at the Suriname border. Now for the news in detail. Indigenous women record the highest instance of cervical cancer in Guyana. This is according to the coordinator of the Chronic Diseases Department in the Health Ministry, Dr. Karen Boyle. More details in this report. Dr. Karen Boyle, coordinator of the Chronic Diseases Unit in the Ministry of Health, today told participants gathered at the World Cancer Day Symposium at the Carol Lodge that Amerindian women are being ravaged by cervical cancer. This, she said, can be attributed to the fact that Amerindian women engage in sexual activities at an early age. When you look at the proportion of cervical cancer cases for all cancers in an ethnic group, what we find is that cervical cancer is ravaging the Amerindian women. And this data uh, can be verified at the Cancer Registry uh, 2009 data. Most of these developing countries have fragile health systems that are already stretched to meet the needs of the infectious diseases. In many of these countries, and including the donor agencies, we find there's a disproportionate allocation of budgets when we look at the allocation to infectious diseases versus chronic diseases. Traditionally, there's about an 80% budgetary allocation for health to chronic, not sorry, to infectious diseases, whereas chronic diseases are the heavier burden. So it's time that we play catch up and rethink our priorities and put our money and our resources where the greater need is. She lamented that more attention and resources need to be given to help prevent the spread of chronic diseases. Prostate cancer, lung and cervical cancers are identified as the main cancers affecting uh, the Guyanese population. In fact, Guyana has the third highest rate of death from cervical cancer in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, when we look at the breakdown um, by race, Afro-Guyanese males account for 65% of our prostate cancer cases. Afro-Guyanese women present the highest cases of cervical cancers, 39%, whereas Indo-Guyanese women have the highest cases of breast cancer, 45%. She said that prevention is the key in reducing the spread of cancer and other chronic diseases throughout the country. To date, several programs have been developed by the Ministry of Health to aid in the fight against chronic diseases, the most recent of which would be the fitted reality TV show. World Cancer Day was observed today under the theme, Reducing Stigma and Dispel Myths. 24-year-old David Bailey of Rose Hall Town Quarantine made his first court appearance today before Magistrate Rabindra Nath Singh at the Albion Magistrate's Court charged with assault. Bailey, a father of four, pleaded guilty to the charge which he committed against his common-law wife, Audrey Giddens, on January 24 at Rose Hall Tongue. Police prosecutor Philip Sheriff told the court that the accused and the complainant had a misunderstanding on the day of the incident at about 700 hours and as a result, the accused dealt the woman several slaps and cuffs about her body. According to the prosecutor, the woman reported the matter and the accused was subsequently arrested and charged. However, the accused denied cuffing the woman but claimed that he indeed dealt her two slaps and not as much as was indicated by the prosecutor. Meanwhile, after the accused pleaded with the magistrate, stating that he will not do this again, the magistrate plea placed Bailey on a bond for one week to keep the peace and told him that if he is to get into any trouble with the law during the one-week period, he will be arrested and placed in jail for one month. After hearing this, the accused told the magistrate that he would prefer to spend the month in jail since it will keep him away from his wife. The magistrate told the defendant that he could not do so since the one-week bond was already inserted on the jacket. General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party, Civic Clement Rohe, says that the opposition seemed to be shielding money launderers by stalling the passage of the anti-money laundering bill. Her details in this report. If a bill is aimed at 
thwarting people who are engaged in illegal activities and in this respect money laundering and financing of terrorism. And you are doing almost everything to throw a span in the works. You are doing everything to block that from going through. Two questions arise. Are you doing it for political purposes? Or are you doing it for people who will benefit from the non-passage of the legislation? Certainly can't, you can't be doing it for the benefit of the country because the whole world knows. Now, with this matter reaching Paris, the whole world knows that Guyana is up for sanctions. Rohi said that he is convinced of this even more now after the opposition walked out of the Parliamentary Special Select Committee on Monday evening interrupting the proceedings. The opposition abandoned the committee meeting on Monday evening in objection to a motion proposed by Finance Minister Dr. Ashni Singh to have the private sector committee observe the proceedings of the committee. Rohi noted that when it comes to transparency, one cannot blow hot and cold water on such issues. If we are committed to the principle of transparency, we can't only talk transparency, we have to do transparency questioned as to why the government has not taken any action against those money launders they are aware of. The General Secretary stated that when the laws are passed, they will be able to do so. When this bill passes, it will allow us to go after money launderers. The bill speaks itself. Anti-money laundering, countering the financing of terrorism. This is not just a, a, a bill for the purpose of show. The bill empowers the state to take legal action against persons who are involved in money laundering. It's not a puppy show. It's serious business. If it wasn't serious business, it would not have reached to this level of the international community. The anti-money laundering bill was deferred to the Special Select Committee for the third time after it received non-approval. With a mid-February deadline, the committee is tasked with completing the bill to have it present to the House in time. Reporting for the Evening News, Vanu Manikchan. Meanwhile, the People's Progressive Party Civic General Secretary said the people of Linden must be applauded for rejecting political confrontation, disunity and division peddled by the opposition-led Regional Democratic Council in Region 10. Details in this Svetlana Marshall report. The poorly attended protest during President Donald Ramatar's visit to Linden on Saturday, January 25, is a clear indication that the people of Linden are now rejecting political confrontation, disunity and division. People's Progressive Party Civic General Secretary Clement Rohi, while speaking at Freedom House today, said failed attempts to mobilize support for a shutdown in the mining town shows Lindeners' desire to move beyond confrontational politics. In the estimation of the party, a great majority of Guyanese are becoming increasingly weary of the opposition's politics of confrontation, disunity and division, which continues to detract from the country's national development objectives. He said all across Guyana, citizens are testifying against the negative impacts of the opposition politics, as he alluded to the month-long unrest in Linden, which started on July 18 following the shooting to death of three Lindeners. Roy said the opposition should rather push for positive and productive activities within Linden. A perfect example supporting this argument is... Despite claims about Linden being the most marginalized and impoverished community in Guyana, the regional administration returned double-digit millions to the national coffers for 2030. It was explained that the money was budgeted for developmental work in the region. However, according to him, the opposition regional leaders were preoccupied promoting disunity and division. 
Thanks to Atlanta, the February criminal sessions of the Burby Societies opened yesterday with the traditional parade and march pass by 32 ranks on B Division. Scores of Burbicians came out to watch the police march from the Coburg Street to High Street in unity to the four-member band. Cadet Officer Ronald Ali, assisted by Inspector Dennis Stevens, led the parade which was inspected by Justice Diana Insanali. Inside the court, Rakash Janak, pleaded guilty to the lesser count of manslaughter after the indictment was read to him. Janak was responsible for the death of Bretonel Richard Isaacs, called Tongi, a 31-year-old mason of Ithaca, West Bank, Burbese, on October 27, 2012, at Blairmont. State Prosecutor Renita Singh asked for an adjournment after Justice Insanali suggested that a probation report on the accused be presented. Before the prosecution presented its facts of the case, Attorney Raymond Ali agreed to the presentation of the probation report, forcing Singh to ask for the matter to be adjourned until February 11 when that report is expected to be presented and Janak should be sentenced. In this report, you will hear that the Ghana Elections Commission has moved to shortlist four persons to be interviewed for the post of Chief Elections Officer. We are joined by Samuel Suknandan. GCOM's chairman, Dr. Steve Serge Bali, said out of the four candidates, two are local and the other two candidates are based overseas. The two local candidates are Calvin Ben, who is serving as the acting chief elections officer, and Kit Lowenfield, who is acting deputy chief elections officer. Both Ben and Lowenfield served several years as senior officers of the Ghana Elections Commission. Meanwhile, the names of the two candidates from overseas were not disclosed. However, the GCOM chairman told his newscast that the interviews for these two candidates will be done initially via teleconferencing using Skype. When asked what is taking so long for the commission to select a suitable person for the post of CEO, Serge Bali said, and I quote, We are not going to rush this process. We will take our time in selecting a suitable candidate. End of quote. The GCOM chairman explained that he wants to ensure that the selection process remains transparent and far from any issues. The process, he stated, will take as long as it is required to take simply because GCOM is looking for the best candidate to fill the post of CEO. GCOM had initially received 14 applications for the vacancy published for the post of CEO. The commissioners, including the chairman, started to look at these applications since last year. The GCOM chairman has again expressed hope that the process for the selection of a new CEO remains free from political interference. Ghana could hold local government elections this year based on a promise made by government to ensure this happens. The post of CEO is therefore important for the proposed local government elections. For the evening news, I'm Samuel Suknandan. Thanks, Samuel. Over 80 farmers cultivating lands on Tiger Island and the Essequibo Islands are calling for improved drainage and vehicles in an effort to assist them in transporting their agricultural produce. Farmers said they need vehicles to transport fertilizers and feed to their farmlands. They made a call during a meeting with the minister within the Ministry of Agriculture, Ali Bash, on Sunday. The farmers told Minister Bash that they are willing to expand production. However, they are hamstrung by the lack of reliable transportation to take their produce from the island to the Esukiba coast. Minister Bash, during his inspection of several farmlands on the island, assured the farmers that the Agriculture Ministry will try to assist in the situation. Bash encouraged farmers to continue to cultivate and expand since more more markets are available in non-traditional crops. He told them to contemplate and add in value to their produce. This is the evening news. More news after these messages. Welcome back. You're tuned to TVG Channel 28. This is the Evening News. The Ghana Revenue Authority has over the past few months seen an increase in the revenue collection from the Ghana and Suriname border trade. Samuel Suknandan filed this report. 
DRA Commissioner General Kershit Sattar told his newscast that revenue collection for that area has climbed from approximately seven million dollars to a whopping twenty-five million dollars weekly. Sattar said that this was made possible after the revenue body placed several new systems in place. This, the DRA boss said, is a clear indication of the loopholes that existed at the Ghana and Suriname border. A new bond is now being rented and used for the purpose of storage by the GRA. We are using that bond to have more effective control and management over goods imported. To a certain extent, we have improved the collection from what it was, say, around September to currently by more than 150 percent. This will help to increase revenues for the country and at the same time ensure that businesses don't have to complain about having to compete with the goods coming from Suriname. There is a concern right now of the smuggling of chicken that is being imported illegally into the country to avoid the taxes from Suriname. There is also concern that large amount of gold is being exported illegally from this country. There is a concern. And we have put measures recently in place to address these concerns. Quite a lot of business is carried out between the two countries, mostly. Goods coming from Suriname, including various types of commodities such as food and household appliances. The importation of goods and the evasion of taxes by these businesses have caused some significant hardship on businesses, causing uneven competition. The Burby's anti-smuggling squad, BAS, was created several years ago to tackle these issues relating to illegal smuggling. There has also been frequent rotation of staff at the GRA office at that border. For the Evening News, I'm Samuel Suknandan. Natural Resources and Environment Minister Robert Bassot said that the June 2014 ban on the non-biodegradable material styrofoam will only be applied to its usage in the food industry. Alexis Rodney reports. Styrofoam is also used in the construction industry. However, according to Minister Prasad, the ban will only be applied to businesses and persons involved in the food and beverage industries. He was at the time responding to questions posed by reporters regarding the environment at a recent forum held in the ministry's boardroom. Prasad said that the ministry is working collectively with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Ministry of Tourism to speed up the process. So those discussions are taking place to the mechanism in place but I'm quite sure there's a lot of sensitization and already I hear ads on the radio talking about biodegradable boxes people are promoting that and it's always good when you have stakeholders themselves are responsive so when we move to the stage of a ban you don't have that issue where you have to go and make seizure or take action again. Minister said that members of the private sector are responding positively to the plans which seek to foster a healthier environment for all. We're not trying to make people difficult, um, life difficult for people, but rather creating a clean environment, a healthy environment. I mean, any one of us can do the research in terms of the health impact, the negative imp health impact in terms of, uh, of, of styrofoam, what it does, and even what it does in terms of our sanitation or solid waste issues that we have to confront. Prasad said that the ministry continues to hold discussions with the public and members of the private sector seeking to provide information on places where they could source biodegradable materials. The ban on styrofoam is expected to take effect from June 1 of this year. According to Minister Prasad, the initiative could prove useful to Guyanese entrepreneurs who could look at new avenues of producing alternatives to that material. Apart from that, concerns were also raised about the rising amount of food boxes seen during the massive floods in the capital city. For the Evening News, I'm Alexis Rodney. Thanks, Alexis. The Ghana Telephone and Telegraph Company Limited has donated $3.5 million to the Education Ministry to assist with the Children's Mastermind Competition, which is set for next weekend. Here are more details in this report. The $3.5 million check was handed over to the Ministry of Education today by the company's Chief Financial Officer, Justin Ned. The presentation was done at GTNT's head office on Brigdam. Before signing and handing over the check, Ned noted that GTNT is committed to the promotion of youth and cultural activities. GTNT prides itself as being a strong corporate citizen, not only by contributing to public coffers through taxation and license fees, but also by actively participating and supporting activities 
such as the children's costume parade. So as a contribution to our youth celebration after hard work, the Guyana Telephone and Telegraph Company is pleased to present $3,500,000 to the 2014 parade. Accepting the check was Chief Education Officer of the Ministry, Ola Sam, who expressed his gratitude to the company for its contributions to one of the major events on the academic and cultural calendars. I think is a culminating activity for um, all of the talent and, and, and budding um, potential that we see in relation to the arts in general. Uh, our students have been engaged for the last two weeks in, in all the regions in this country in the, the events leading up to this major event where they're, as you would have seen in the press, they're demonstrating their, their skills in, in all dimensions of the performing art. This is the third year the telephone company has provided its support to the event. The annual Children Mash Costume and Parade competition will be held on February 15th. According to Desri Wild Ogle of the Ministry, some 2,000 students will be participating in the competition. What a spectacular um, activity where approximately 2,000 children take uh, to the streets in costumes of various kinds. We have from the nursery, um, the secondary, primary and secondary schools participating in this activity. In addition, this is the time that we culminate all the activities for the children's mash, and so we'll have all regions represented on the parade. Guyanese are urged to come out and support the event, which will pave way for the main mash parade on February 23rd. The sole rice mill in Jamaica completely replaced the U.S. paddy rice with imports from Guyana in 2013, mainly due to the higher prices of U.S. rice, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA. The USDA says that Jamaica did not import any paddy rice from the U.S. in 2013 for the first time in recent history. Traditionally, Jamaica's rice imports consisted of 20% of the U.S. paddy rice, but the share of U.S. paddy rice in Jamaica's rice imports has been declining in the last five years. According to the USDA, Jamaica's total rice import market remains steady at about 90,000 tons. However, the U.S. paddy rice imports by Jamaica declined about 93% from around 46,000 tons in 2008 to 3,300 tons in 2012 and have vanished in 2013. Meanwhile, Jamaica's rice imports from Suriname have been increasing in the past five years. Suriname accounted for around 28% of Jamaica's total imports in 2011, according to the USDA. Trade sources say that the change in the pattern is due to the quality and pricing issues, according to the USDA. While Guyana paddy rice prices remain high, those are cheaper than the U.S. paddy rice prices. However, local sources say the tariff on U.S. imports could be another reason, since imports from both Guyana and Suriname receive preferential treatment under the common external tariff set for the community CARICOM countries and set on rice for non-CARICOM countries is 25%. Paddy price imports from the U.S., which is not a member of CARICOM, becomes comparatively expensive. The pressure is on. Youth bodies and leaders are calling on policymakers to invest in young people as it is essential to Ghana's social and economic development. We're joined by Natasha Aziz. Mark Ross, Executive Director, Global Youth Movement, explained that despite the vast knowledge and research conducted towards the investment in young people, it is essential to a nation's social and economic development. Ross added that with the timely implementation of youth development programs, more young people can be better guided when making rational decisions. Does not see the need for invest, investing in young people. Okay. And there's a lot of research, uh, the wide body of knowledge um, that's out there that, that posits that if you invest in our young people and you do that in a timely manner in the right programs and the right policies, then your investment will work 
the wild. Oma Davy Box, a member of the National Youth Steering Committee for the National Youth Policy, noted that there is a greater need for more youth-oriented programs dealing specifically with issues affecting youth socially and economically. There for them, but say for example if you take a youth from Region 1, how would they get access to those opportunities? They have to come down to the city or come down to the more populated areas to get access to these. So what are the challenges is that taking these access to these opportunities which we have available and enhancing it so that young people in these remote areas would have these access. Raul Small, chairman of the National Stakeholders Committee for the National Youth Policy of Guyana, says that youths in Guyana need to develop their identities to make a difference here. Reports that show basically three important components of youth development. One is that youth value and need recognition. Two, uh, youth value and we should encourage them to develop their own identities. And uh, the third one is engagement and, and, and participation, um, recognizing that youth have a lot to offer in the development process. For the Evening News, Natasha Aziz. Thanks, Natasha. This is the Evening News. More news on the other side of the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're tuned to the Evening News. As part of the new GPC's ongoing efforts to aid in the development of culture and arts in the lives of youth in Guyana, a sponsored check was handed over to the Panwave Academy Steel Orchestra. And Arakan has details in this story. The Panwave Seal Orchestra offers underprivileged children as well as children who attend schools which do not have music programs the opportunity to become literate in music. New GPC believes investing in new development is crucial to the success of our nation. We would like to encourage other organizations to come on board and support similar institutions. The Panwave Orchestra began in 2001 and was the initiative of a group of young graduates from Queen's College and President's College, along with Mrs. Mildred Lowe from the Allied Arts Department of the Ministry of Education. The aim of the initiative was to provide training in music theory and practical. The idiom that we chose was the steel band, and since then the program has trained about 350 students, and we continue to work with various organizations and schools to provide training. Um, I think it's quality training that we give these children and it's not just training in music but they're also um, being mentored by persons who would have formed the program and would have left the program. Andrew Tindall, band manager, stated that at the end of the program, the students will be molded into citizens who can make a positive contribution to the success of the country. I have been with the Panwave Academy for about two years and um, it has really benefited me because I am um, a lover of music and when I was small my sister used to play steel band I've always enjoyed it and I just decided to, hey it's an opportunity for me to learn since my school doesn't have a steel band a steel band yes it's really benefited me Javonka Williams a past student of the Academy said that the orchestra has made a positive impact on her life stating that it had her occupied and also helped with her grades Anara Khan reporting for the evening news Patients suffering from severe kidney problems will now benefit from enhanced dialysis and treatment being offered freely. Natasha Aziz tells us more in this story. Patients suffering from severe kidney problems and needs urgent attention will soon benefit from better quality of medical attention. Professor Dr. Ian Carlyle of McMaster University in Canada has disclosed that through a collaborative effort with the Ministry of Health and the Dubai Medical Center, kidney transplant surgeries could become available in Guyana. There are, there are a lot of patients coming in and they're coming in at a very late stage. So we would like to see more uh, patients um, being planned for dialysis, if you like. So first of all, we'd like, to, we'd like to try and prevent patients getting to the point of dialysis. And we think there's uh, room for improvement in that respect. Um, better control of, di of diabetes, high blood pressure, recognizing the kidney problem earlier. If the patient is going to start dialysis within 6 to 12 months, 
being ready for that, being prepared. Um, and we'd also like to try and prevent people getting to the point of needing dialysis. That would be the ideal way of handling kidney disease, preventing them needing dialysis. The kidney specialist added that while the center sees a number of patients daily, most of the patients come at a time when there is very little the doctors can do. We are actively looking at that. We definitely will need the help of um, uh, the Ministry of Health of uh, Georgetown Hospital. We, we, we're hoping that we can come together to work out uh, plans for transplantation and proceed to doing transplants in Georgetown Hospital. But I think everybody would understand this is complicated. Transplants are not easy. Um, and it's going to take a lot of planning for us to get there. The Dubai Medical Center was established in 2011. For the Evening News, Natasha Aziz. Thanks, Natasha. Home Affairs Minister Clement Rohi has said that noise nuisance in the society is a constant struggle his ministry is faced with, despite its name and shame campaign, which was launched several years ago. In an interview with this newscast, he stated that this is a relentless struggle, a constant battle that has to go on. Rohi noted that the name and shame campaign implemented by the Home Affairs Ministry a few years ago is still active and has seen some amount of progress. He disclosed that a list of names was recently published in the newspapers of the perpetrators. According to the minister, the ministry will keep publishing those names from time to time, identifying persons that have been accused. The minister further explained that when reports are made through the campaign, his ministry would also relay the information to the commissioner of police and the respective divisional commanders who will then investigate and institute charges if necessary. Rohi noted that some of these cases do in fact reach the court level, resulting in fines penalties and prosecution. However, the Home Affairs Minister noted that while some people are adapting to the rules of the laws, there are some who are totally irresponsible, and so the ministry, through the police force, have to constantly go after them. He suggested that maybe higher fines and stricter penalties may be what is needed to curb the noise nuisance issue. Habitat for Humanity is currently in discussion with a Japanese organization for the construction of low-income homes in Guyana. Natasha Aziz brings us details in this story. Habitat for Humanity's National Director Raul Small has disclosed that talks are ongoing with a Japanese organization on the construction of low-cost homes here. Though the deal has not been sealed, Small noted that this venture will meet out to the less fortunate people of Guyana. Um, it's not a deal as yet. However, um, we, have, we are in talks, we are in some discussions. Um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag or let too much, maybe just um, the tail right now. <laughs> but, um, but nonetheless, we are hoping to um, establish another habitat resource center. Um, I, this will be in Region 10. Um, and we also hope to uh, have a, f a fully functioning um, youth, youth development and, and community development program uh, there as well too. So um, our aim is to at least have um, the contract, the agreement inked um, sometime uh, before the end of this year and, and possibly um, we want to see how soon we can um, commence uh, the construction and other preparatory works and so however this is nothing new since habitat for humanity has helped guyanese to construct hundreds of homes across the country over the last 19 years in addition, the director disclosed that Edward Bihari Company Limited, in a collaborative effort, has extended its involvement in a project which provides homes for those who cannot afford it. We are working under um, a concept or with a concept which is called the Participatory Market Systems Development. Now, in a nutshell, this basically means um, looking at the market impact that your services are making or your interventions are making. So not just looking at, oh, how many houses I've built for the year and how many families I have um, housed for the year, but what sort of impact are we making at different areas within the market. Habitat for Humanity Guyana has become more community focused in an effort to advance the construction of housing in impoverished communities. For the Evening News, Natasha Aziz. 
Stay with us on the other side of the break. It's your Sportcast. Welcome back. This is the Evening News. It's now time for a look at what's happening in the world of sport. But first, your headlines. Tom Moody named Director of Cricket for the Lima Call CPL. FIFA expressed concerns over Guyana's gold project. And dates for the Inter-Guyana Games confirmed. Now for the news in detail. The Lima Call Caribbean Premier League has announced that former Australia international Tom Moody has joined its ranks as director of cricket. Moody has vast experience at the top level of the game, having represented Australia, Warwickshire and Western Australia and were set ashore as a player before turning his attention to coaching, commentary and cricket administration. Following his retirement from the game in 2001, Moody became president of the Australian Cricketers Association and coach and then director of of the cricket at the World Setashire Stadium. In 2005, he was appointed as Sri Lanka's coach, guiding the team to the World Cup final in April 2007 before returning home to coach Western Australia. He's currently coach for IPL franchise Sunrisers Hybridad. The second edition of the Lima Call Caribbean Premier League tournament will commence on July 10 and concludes on August 16 with Guyana hosting four of the 13 matches to be played. Development Officer of FIFA Howard McIntosh made a brief visit to Guyana to avow the status on the gold project, which is yet to begin. Tristan Joseph joins us with details in this report. Guyana, one of the first countries to receive the approval for the gold project since 1998, has seen no work being done by the Guyana Football Federation to kickstart the program. However, FIFA remains committed to seeing the development of the project in Guyana, according to McIntosh. Nothing has changed in terms of FIFA's commitment to the gold project. Uh, we are committed to see it happen. We are concerned that the, 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 at the pace, we'd love to see things moving along because our interest, as I indicated earlier, is that we do get the facilities up and running. Delay in putting the infrastructure on the ground only hurts the sport. Meanwhile, Guyana has received land from the Ministry of Sport to house their gold project, which will have to be leased to the GFF if FIFA is to release 500,000 US dollars for the first phase. The MOU needs to include the phase development plan and the costing to it. Um, and a draft MOU would have been submitted. It, it, it needs to have that, basically, and uh, for the government to sign that MOU along with the GFF and to issue a lease lease agreement. Because as was told to the Minister this afternoon, I was reminded um, and we indicated to him that FIFA will not release a cent unless there is an understanding that there is such a lease existing. McIntosh also visited facilities in New Amsterdam Burbies where he noted that it is good to develop the game outside of the capital city and hopes to visit other regions when he returns. Former West Indies pacer Jerome Taylor made an impressive return to regional first-class cricket as Jamaica cruised an easy six-wicket win over Ireland in their Nagico Super 50 match at the Queen's Park Oval on Monday. Taylor, who last played for Jamaica against Trinidad in March 2011, grabbed three wickets to help destroy the Irish and send them crashing to their second straight loss after their 114 runs defeat to Guyana. Opener John Campbell top scored with a powerful half-century to steer Jamaica to the winning target after comeback pacer Taylor and medium pacer Andre Russell ripped through the Ireland line up, dismissing them for 106-1 in 46.1 overs. Campbell struck a well-placed 7-1 and batted through most of the innings, hitting six fours and two sixes to carry his side to within eight runs of the target before he was bowled. Earlier, Niall O'Brien top scored with 35 for the Irish. Andre Russell, who was named the man of the match, finished 
finished with best figures of 3 for 19. Taylor, who did not play in Jamaica's opening game against Windwards and who last represented the West Indies in June 2010 against South Africa, picked up three wickets for 33 runs, while Lambert bagged two for 27. Director of Sport Neil Kumar has confirmed the dates for the 2014 Inter-Guyana Games in an exclusive interview with the Evening News Sport today. Her details in this report. Kumar disclosed that Guyana will be hosting four sporting disciplines in football, swimming, athletics and basketball from March 8th to 12th in the first phase of the 2014 IGG Games. I must say that I'm very heartened to report that the IGG for 2014 is definitely on. There will be two phases. The first phase will be held in Guyana from the 8th to 12th of May. And in that phase, you will play in football, swimming, athletics, and swimming, football, athletics, and basketball. That, 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 those four games will be played in the first phase. However, with the Youth Basketball Guyana in conjunction with the National Sports Commission hosting their school basketball festival in July, the IGG Basketball Tournament, according to Kumar, will be played on the last weekend of July. Meanwhile, French Guyana might be returning to participate in the Games since 2010 when they last competed at the event. What is very hard is that the Suriname, the French uh, ambassador to Suriname and a representative from the French Guyana was present at the meeting and they, they, they were very, very active. They, they participated fully in the meeting. And they also signed the minutes of the meeting. Uh, and they agreed that French Guyana will be participating in the games again. They will be making genuine effort to see the French Guyana participate in the game. For other, the Kashif and Shanghai group will be relied upon to look after the national junior side for the football aspect of the games. Do join us on the other side of the break. Your approach reports are next. Welcome back. It's now time for a look at your bridge reports. The Demerara Harbour Bridge will be closed on Wednesday, February 5 at 8 hours 30 for a period of one and a half hours. The Burbies River Bridge will be closed on Wednesday, February 5 at 7 hours 45 for a period of one and a half hours. That's your Tuesday, February 4 edition of the Evening News. I'm Michael Young. Thanking you very much for joining us and encouraging you to do join us at 700 hours tomorrow for our morning news. Goodbye.